methodically processing system. There's a remarkable thing about our solar system. It's really big, and we're really small. This planet that we live on, the one where it takes a day by plane to cross, it's really nothing at all. 99.86% of the mass of our solar system resides inside the sun. Meanwhile, the gas giant Jupiter makes up 75% of the mass of all the planets in the system. And despite this, Jupiter still only makes up but one thousandth of the mass of our solar system. And before you get ahead of yourself, start to think, maybe the Earth is making some meaningful contributions to the system's mass. Just a minute. The other 17% of the mass of the planets is locked up inside of Saturn, and most of the 8% that's left over goes to the rest of the gas giants. You and I live on a speck of dust, but to say that the Earth is just a speck of dust orbiting the Sun is a disservice to specks of dust everywhere. You can see motes of dust floating in the air, can't see the planet Earth floating in our solar system. In the grand scheme of things, you and I are nothing. Our planet is nothing. If you're anything like me, all of this, no matter how many times you think about it, and no matter how many times you are reminded of it, will blow your mind. If nothing else, because you and I trying to wrap our little minds around such vast differences in scale is a bit like an ant trying to lift an elephant all on its own. It just doesn't work. To understand why, we need to look at the mathematical nature of our biology. Each of you listening can run out into the world and find two random adult volunteers. Strip them down and put them on a scale. When you do, you'll find something funny. You can then whip out your measuring tape and measure your volunteers' heights. And again, you'll notice a funny thing. You could measure the length of their hands, the circumference of their heads, and so on. And you'd still notice this funny thing. Or maybe, rather, it's all unfunny and really quite boring. Because what you would notice is that these humans aren't that different from one another. Sure, they'll be slightly different. Someone might be 190 pounds and someone else might be 110 pounds. One person might be 5 feet 3 inches and another 6 feet and 6 inches tall. But they're not so different that if you added up their heights or weights, that one of them would account for 99.86% of the weight or the height. That's because our height and our weights and most of our physical characteristics are approximately normally distributed. Or rather, they are approximately normally distributed because no single adult human is the size of Godzilla or a small moon, nor is any adult human the size of an ant. The same is true for our hands and our other organs, and yes, someone might have a slightly bigger head, but in the grand scheme of things, no one is walking around with a skyscraper-sized skull. Most things related to our biology are also approximately normally distributed. Our maximum running speed, the amount of calories we consume every day, 
the number of hours we sleep in a night are all in that normally distributed neighborhood. The fastest human isn't that much faster than the average human. Binging food one day won't make up a significantly high proportion of your yearly caloric intake. And no one is going to sleep for a million hours in a single day. Of course, being human, we are compelled to project our own biases onto the world around us. If everything about our biology is normally distributed, then surely everything about the world we live in is also normally distributed. Now wouldn't that be nice? For a long time, that's exactly what people assumed. Or maybe they just didn't think about it at all. Take human ownership of land. If land ownership is like your height and your weight, then you'd expect that if you picked any random two people in the world and asked them how much land they owned, you'd get something generally balanced. One person might own one acre and the other one and a quarter acres. Instead, if you actually try this, what you might get is something like this. One person owns no land at all. The other, say, the Queen of England, might own over six billion acres of land. This kind of disparity would be disastrous if it occurred in something like adult human height and weight. If such a thing were to happen, you might get one person who is a foot tall and another who is 35,000 feet tall. Of course, we don't see that happening because a person who is 35,000 feet tall would crumble under Earth's unrelenting gravity. Not to mention, they'd run a serious risk of being struck by airplanes flying around. And never mind how much food you'd have to eat in a day to reach 35,000 feet. So we can't take normally distributed things and make them a bit more extreme because they are bound by certain laws of physics. But what about the other way around? Why can't we take these non-normally distributed things and make them normally distributed? In some cases, like with land ownership, we could if you wanted to, at least for a short time. But as Italian scientist Vilfredo Pareto discovered in the early 20th century, it's not sustainable. What Pareto discovered is that throughout history, wealth and land tended to concentrate over time in approximately an 80-20 ratio. No matter what you did, eventually 20% of the people controlled 80% of the land. Every once in a while, this would change, like brief blips on the radar. The distribution would balance out so that things were more evenly distributed. Yet, no matter what, over time, things would creep back to this 80-20 ratio. A few people would take control of 80% of the land. And then they'd lose it again. A revolution or political upheaval would see elite lands confiscated and redistributed. Then, like clockwork, a new elite minority would rise to the top and take control of most of the land. Rinse and repeat. Pareto described what he observed as a social law, something that is a part of human nature. But is that true? Can some invisible natural force cause the distribution of resources to repeatedly grow unbalanced? Let's go back in time to the beginning of the universe. Everything that is this universe is currently contained in a single tiny point. The fancy word for it is singularity. Then, all of a sudden, it explodes in a great big bang. Everything, and I literally mean everything, explodes and for an instant 
is perfectly and evenly distributed. But all the motion and chaos from one instant to the next means that some parts of space have a slight edge in their local area, so slight that words can't describe how small these edges can be. A speck more matter here, a speck more matter there. Just enough that one region of space exerts a hint more gravitational pull than the other. That slight edge, that tiny imbalance, pulls more and more matter towards it. Before you know it, an extra speck of matter has helped pull all the local matter towards it. Fast forward billions of years, and here we are, a speck of dust that didn't quite get sucked up all the way into the central mass of our solar system, the sun. Our hunk of rock, the thing that we call Earth, represents just three millionth of the mass of the solar system, most of which is in that ball of fire we call the sun. Earth is a speck that didn't quite escape the gravitational pull of the sun, but also it didn't quite get sucked into it either, at least not yet anyway. So how do we make the sun give back all the mass that it sucked up? Well, believe it or not, our sun is not quite big enough to explode and redistribute its mass in a nice even cloud, the thing that we call a nebula. So it will do so gradually. Over the next five or so billion years, it's going to swell up, destroy the earth in the process and most of the specks of dust around it, and then slowly begin to release its mass into a nice, small, and hopefully pretty nebula. It will continue to release that gas and mass until it turns into a relatively cool, dense, dead black lump called a black dwarf. And after that, nobody knows. The universe is still so young that there probably aren't any black dwarfs out there yet. Now, if our sun were slightly bigger, some scientists theorize that its lump and remains could eventually go supernova. That is, they could undergo an immense explosion that would then distribute its mass in a huge cloud of gas. That nebula would then presumably undergo the same local version of the process the universe underwent with the Big Bang. Slight variations in mass here and there would give some regions an advantage over others, and we'd end up with new stars and planets with tiny motes of dust around them. As we've learned before, concentrated things are dangerous and explosive. In case you hadn't noticed, the sun is a burning ball of fire. Reducing the concentration of highly concentrated things is often a violent and destructive process. It's cataclysmic change, and often nothing adapted to the previous state survives. And here's where you and I come in. Sitting on this mode of dust, we owe our existence to the very particular distribution of mass that exists in this system. If Jupiter were slightly smaller, or the Sun slightly bigger, we probably wouldn't be here. And eventually, the Sun will lose its concentrated mass. Because even its relatively modest level of concentration makes it more unstable on the cosmic scale. So it'll expand, it'll wipe us out, and a new distribution of mass will take its place. That new order will, for brief moment, experience something akin to an even balance, before quickly resuming the huge, massive asymmetries that seem to be part of the fundamental fabric of our universe. And all of this because a single invisible force makes one bit of mass attracted to another mass. We call that force gravity.